The RB47 Stratojet is a six crew member, beautifully streamlined superjet, so technologically advanced at the time, it could handle just about anything. It's also why the UAP chase incident it encountered off the coast of the Gulf of Mexico is so well documented and controversial. Let's explore. Hi everyone and welcome to Project Blue Book, where we explore all things unidentified. I am Thor and thanks for tuning in. This is an important case, both because of its timing and the history of ufology, and also because it was documented by five distinct and trustworthy sources. One, by radar tracking instruments on board the RB-47. Two, by visual contact made by the pilot and the co-pilot of the RB-47. Three, by ground radar tracking. Four, by the airplane's sophisticated electronic countermeasure equipment. And five, by the fact that six crew members on board the RB-47 were all experienced aviators, officers, and trained in the U.S. Air Force and all testified to what they saw behaving like no other aircraft they had ever seen. Seemingly an intelligently controlled object at 35 to 45,000 feet, intentionally tracking their own movement. It's also a case where key UFO debunker Philip Klass went to town with a thick report of his own, introducing a viewpoint alternative to the UAP scenario twisting the facts into a pretzel to fit an alternative hypothesis. Despite his efforts, the RB-47 encounter of July 17, 1957, remains one of the unsolved, unidentified aerial phenomena encounters currently listed in the Pentagon files over UAP cases they recognize to be unidentified to this day. First, some historical context. 1957 was a little over four years after the Robertson Committee that met in January 1953 submitted their recommendations to the Pentagon and the CIA that for public relations reasons, greatly suffering since the Washington flap of 1952 and six years after Roswell, recognized the need to resolve most all unexplained flying object cases, or else the Air Force and the military would face continued doubts over their controls in the skies, let alone the impossibility of recognizing the presence of intelligently controlled aircraft not of U.S. origin and not of Soviet origin and possibly not of human origin either. It was an admission that was simply unsustainable, wrote the Robertson panel. Therefore, the recommendation was to deny and explain away by any means available, most all UFO incidents as human or natural phenomena, while simultaneously ridiculing those who claim them to be anything else, and thirdly, continue to study the phenomena of UFOs in secret for military and intelligence benefit. When the RP-47 incident took place in 1957, mere four years later, pressure was on to fully explain it away while documenting everything and everyone's testimony, and quietly gather the technological evidence, and then summon a committee to investigate. This case has the hallmark of all of the above, a literal textbook case, following the advice of the Robertson Committee's recommendation. The RB-47 Stratojet departed Forbes Air Force Base in Topeka, Kansas after midnight on a mission to achieve multiple objectives, including training of its gunnery, sophisticated latest technology and navigation, and the electronic countermeasure equipment, acronym ECM. Its specialty was the detection of enemy radar and flight signatures. It was literally the perfect instrument to detect UFOs. And this was its training mission. The intended flight path was to head south across Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, then turning east over the Gulf of Mexico, turning north towards Gulfport, Mississippi, then west near Meridian, Mississippi, back towards Fort Worth, and then north to home base at Forbes, Kansas. The RB-47 had six officer crew members. 
Pilot Major Louis D. Chase, Co-Pilot Officer James H. McCoy, Thomas H. Handley, Navigator, John J. Provenanzo, Monitor Number One, Frank B. McClure, Monitor Number Two, and Walter Tuckshearer, Monitor Number Three. The three monitors operated the high-tech ECMs, and Monitor 2, Frank B. McClure, detected an unusual paint on his scope at 4 a.m., a radar blip passing a distance in front of the RB-47 over Mississippi at around 35,000 feet and climbing rapidly out of sight near Gulfport, Mississippi. In his report, he stated that he first thought this was a ground-based radar signature, but then it began to move and when it crossed their path and ascended up in front of him to a two o'clock position, he realized it was a flying craft. McClure was perplexed by what he saw, but did not alert his fellow crew members yet. At the same moment, Captain Chase visually saw a light at his left and at his altitude coming fast in his direction. He gave a command to the crew to brace for evasive action, but before he could act, the object shot from the left to the right in front of the cockpit at incredible speed and then blinked out. The pilot then advised the crew what the flight deck had observed and it was only then that McClure came forward to advise of his sighting on his ECM system. A few minutes later, 4.10 a.m., the pilot and the co-pilot were again startled, this time by the sudden appearance of an intense blue light bearing down on their aircraft. Even more unsettling to them was the fact that the object abruptly changed course and vanished at the two o'clock position. It disappeared in front of their eyes like a light was switched off and at that moment the aircraft radar and its navigator also detected a strong signal present in the same location. There was no rhyme or reason or consistency between the visual representation and the radar signature of the object. As the RB-47 continued its flight path towards East Texas, the UFO maintained its position on radar relative to the aircraft, clearly following it, intermittently reappearing visually to the pilot and co-pilot. Monitor number one, John Provenzano, switched his instrument to the same frequency at 3000 megahertz to also discover a strong signal emanating from the UFO's two o'clock position. Two ECMs shield the UFO in the same place at the same time. They continued their flight, now communicating what they were observing to ground military radar control. Their sighting was yet to intensify. At 4.39, the aircraft, now over East Texas, within the radar coverage area of another ground radar station, the Utah Air Force Radar Unit in Duncanville. The crew was growing increasingly uncomfortable with their mysterious flight following companion, Pilot Chase observed a huge light 5,000 feet below him at 2 o'clock. And even if he couldn't prove it, he was under the distinct impression that this huge bright light was sitting atop of a much larger object, which would make it larger than the RB-47, perhaps as large as a football field. McClure now saw two signal impressions at 40 and 70 degrees, indicating that two distinct objects were following them, keeping the distance, altitude, and flight paths of the RB-47. Pilot Chase and co-pilot McCoy were now able to confirm a second UFO visually. At 4.42, Captain Chase informed Utah Radar Control he was going to fly towards the object, and when he increased ground speed to 500 miles per hour, the UFO retreated picking up the same rate of speed. The distance between them did not diminish. Their visibility continued, and McClure confirmed their presses on radar at the same time. It was about 10 miles from Fort Worth, Texas at 4.50 a.m. that the Utah radar detected the UFO stopping abruptly, and the RB-47, already on a northern heading, simply passed it by. It mysteriously vanished off McClure's ECM, and off Utah's ground radar a few minutes later. The crew thought it was all over at this point as they corrected course, returning back to Forbes Air Force Base. When the bright light suddenly reappeared off to the side again, 
At 4.55, Chase notified Utah. As much as he wanted to continue to chase these lights, he had to return to Forbes as his fuel was running low. They had deviated enough of their mission already. At 5.40, Chase spotted the UFO for the last time, heading towards Oklahoma City, where it vanished for the last time. It had traveled 800 miles along the multi-cornered flight path of the RB-47, over the Gulf of Mexico, and over the states of Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, and Oklahoma for 90 minutes of flight time. This case wasn't known until 12 years later when the Condon Committee report was released and listed this case as unidentified, even if the U.S. Air Force kept this thoroughly investigated case under wraps, explained it as a misidentification that what the crew saw and misidentified was a commercial airliner. A concoction of explanations was offered by Philip J. Class, one of the most prominent UFO debunkers of all time. He suggested in a lengthy report that the six-member crew and their instrumentation had misidentified the light and radar signals as a complicated interplay of radio wave reading errors, the successive appearances of a meteor, the star Vega, and an airliner that supposedly appeared to offer the visual reference on at least two of the location occasions. When the case appeared in the Condon Report, led by physicist Edward U. Condon out of the University of Colorado, and was published in 1969, Committee member and investigator Gordon David Thayer rejected the explanation of a commercial airliner, but got so many parts wrong, including the date of the event. It was hard to believe the Content Committee had any intent to thoroughly research anything at all. This had indeed become a very confusing case. Confusing enough that any debunking theory, in the face of the conflicting information available, began to sound plausible. It's a case that proves how disinformation campaign works to disarm real information and ultimately challenge the truth. You can watch and listen to this and other podcasts on Project Blue Book, where we explore all things unidentified. Each day, let's practice compassion and kindness. And please subscribe. I am Thor, and thanks again for tuning in. See you next time.